Hi, I'm Tony Kramer, your host of the Agriculture Technology Podcast, and I'm sitting down with agriculture technology and equipment experts to help you enhance your operation for today, tomorrow, and into the future. In this episode, Joel Kaczynski and I sit down and chat about the 2023 season of podcast episodes. Uh, We're going to dive in a little bit, give you our thoughts on some of the topics we discussed over the last year and and just chat a little on on where we see the technology industry within agriculture going today and tomorrow. With that, let's dive into the show. Joel, welcome aboard the podcast. Thanks for sitting down with me. We are finishing up year eight of production. This is eight years of the RDO Agriculture Technology Podcast. 2024 is going to move us into production year number nine or season number nine, however you want to look at it. But uh, yeah, really exciting times. Thank you to all the listeners out there, everybody that has liked and subscribed, uh, shared this show with your friends. We wouldn't be able to do this without you. Now, with that, Joel, first thing I want to do is uh, introduce or have you introduce yourself. uh, Tell our listeners a little bit about who you are, where you came from, uh, what you do with RDO and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, thanks, Tony. Super excited to be on here today. I can't believe it's been eight years yeah, <laughs> that we've been on this. Crazy. But yeah, a little background on myself. Um, I've been in the uh, egg business uh, uh, my entire career, um, really my entire life, growing up on a farm uh, in southeast North Dakota. My parents, my family, my grandparents on both sides of the family all farmed. I've always been engaged with the uh, with uh, with the technology too. So it's been I've been passionate about it, how it can improve our lives. Uh, so it's uh, kind of interesting where I'm at uh, uh, today with it. So I've been here with with RDO equipment for uh, 19 years. So it was 2004 when I started the company and I've worked with Tony. It's kind of interesting we're doing a podcast because we talk every day <laughs> about this stuff and uh, uh, it's and it's it'll be neat to share some of our conversations that we have because um, this is just uh, natural for how, what we talk about all the time. And uh and it just it does warm my heart too that this podcast is still going. Um, I give kudos to Nate Dorsey. This is one of the ideas he threw out at me of, of starting this podcast. Um, I was all over it because I felt um, as a way to reach reach more listeners um, and be engaged in the in the in the technology in the in the egg space. And Tony just uh, has continued this and the the breadth of uh, listeners that we have uh, with this and how I'll run into people just randomly that. Uh, um, know this and, and hear Tony and, and he say, do you know, Tony is like, oh yeah, I, I know Tony. So, uh, <laughs> it's really neat. And, uh, so, um, I'm very, uh, honored to be on the, on the podcast and be part of it today. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. It, uh, again, kudos to, uh, Mr. Nate Dorsey. Um, he did a, a great thing by starting this podcast and, uh, I, I too saw the value in it. I wanted to keep it rolling and, and, uh, just keep talking. And, and like you said, the, the breadth of listeners that we reach with this is amazing. So, uh, and again, without you listeners, this wouldn't be possible. Um, we see the value here at RDO equipment. Uh, we see the value in sharing this information information through the podcast. I just wanted to go through essentially our list of episodes, Joel, and kind of talk, get your take on the value you see in some of these technologies or how it's changed the the agriculture landscape. So getting started at the beginning of the 2023 season, I myself, I didn't have a guest on the show, but I dove into conversations about on-farm trials. So doing, uh, whether you're a large farm, you're small scale, you're in between, doesn't matter. We talked about the value of knowing and understanding your farm, whether it be partnering with your John Deere dealer or just learning on your own. I want to hear your thoughts, Joel, on, you know, where, where is the value here? We, we see, trial data from extension agencies, um, input companies, uh, whoever it may be out there in the ag industry. But where do you see the value in these local trials, these on-farm, know-your-land-know-your-crop type stuff? Yeah, thanks, Tony. It takes me back um, to actually when I started in the the industry as an intern 
putting in a, a corn and soybean uh, variety uh, plot, test plot. And uh, uh, so that was my first exposure to it. Um, but even going back before that, uh, you look at you look at how how farmers make decisions on their on their farming operations. It's a variety of ways. Um, and also the unique thing in the egg industry is you can physically drive around and see what things what's happening. You can see what the neighbor's doing. Um, you may not see every single pass, but you drive by the field every day. Hey, it looks really good or it looks really bad. Or and and you talk to another neighbor, you know, the quote unquote coffee shop talk, and uh um you kind of learn, you know, and 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 uh, the 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 farming uh uh, the egg community is 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 very much that way. That social, you know, uh, looking, seeing, always want to improve what you're what you're doing, and you can con- continually do that by watching what others do. Um, these these field trials, though, uh, goes beyond just visual how things look to the actual data um, to really makes a farm profitable or not, and uh, and that's where that's the. That's the key. What I see with the with doing the with doing the field trials, um, and in today's in today's age, uh, with the with the with the cost of inputs, and in our area with the cost of of uh, equipment, um, the the our customers need to know what that return on their investment is going to be, and doing these field trials help us identify. Um, uh, what that ROI could potentially be for that for those for those uh, for our customers and help them make that decision um, around it because we want they, they need to they needs to pay off for them uh, when they when they make a decision to add a new technology um, or buy a new piece of equipment um, that's gonna that's gonna enhance their enhance their productivity in a number of different ways. Yeah, and we I think like I mentioned in the episode, there a lot of this equipment when it comes to uh, the precision egg displays and GPS receivers, we're already collecting a lot of the data that can be utilized to make those educated decisions. So it's just a matter of implementing uh, year over year. I mean, one basic trial, something that a grower wants to learn about what they're doing on the farm. I look at where the where where we're going at with RDO equipment and and some of the tools that John Deere is developing for us um, uh, to to utilize to help our customers in those decisions. Um, but um, one of them is with the agronomy analyzer. Um, we look at what uh, what the egg industry and 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 different companies have leveraged uh, that that on farm field trials. And the replicated ones. One of the difficult things for replication, though, is really putting it all together at the end of the year, you know, and and making relevant to to a certain uh, 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 environment and 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 situation that resonates with our customer base. And and one of the things that uh, with John Deere developing the uh, agronomy analyzer tool um, gives us ability to to make those replicated field trials across a large area. Um, you can bring it into a regional area um, and leverage the, the the entire dealer network of of John Deere as well with that. So um, I see a lot of uh, um, potential opportunity. Um, we've been we've been leveraging some of that as that uh, platform has grown, um, but I really see that as a potential game changer um, to really get us the the numbers um, behind these trials that we're doing. And a lot of them are focused around the technology um, that is coming out. So, Yeah, absolutely. And that that actually reminded me the uh, how we're collecting the data and the time and the replication or, or replicated trials, replicated treatments. That was actually something after I recorded this, this episode in the beginning of 2023, we executed a trial with a customer customer of ours down in South Dakota. And one of the comments that the customer made was what excited him the most about us partnering with him and doing these trials is he kind of said, you know, we want to learn, but we just don't have the time. We don't have the manpower, the resources to execute some of this stuff. So for, for that customer to partner with RDO, partner with your local John Deere dealer to help execute a trial like this, collect the data, 
we as a dealership can learn, but the customer too can learn on on what's going on there. So yeah, it a lot of things can be done, a lot of great stuff. I want to move on to the next episode or the next talking point. This one really excites me. Uh, we at RDO Equipment, we got to be very close to this product uh, prior to its launch and release, but I am talking about John Deere's Exact Shot. So Exact Shot, pulsing fertilizer only on the seed, in the furrow, on your planter. Super exciting. Great things to come with this technology. I want to hear your take, Joel, on exact shot and where you see this growing to into the future. Yeah, I will say the first time that that Tony told me about this new technology coming, um, I thought, no way. <laughs> How in the world, um, when you're putting on, you know, thirty thousand plus seeds per acre, um, that that we're going to be able to put that fertilizer exactly on that, um, and and you're going, especially with the with the increased speeds on the planter as well. Um, it just adds to the adds to the challenge of 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 doing that. Um, but seeing is believing, you know, and being part of that uh, product development and getting the data behind it. Um, really, that's what that's what we need to see to prove that the technology is working, that we are getting that product um, on the on the seed where it needs to be. And that's one of the things too that uh, when we when we look at at that at that uh, at that space of of putting product on at planting. Uh, you know, there's a number of things that we look at. Number one is um, the amount of, of of refilling you need to do, right? That it slows down the planting progress of it. Um, so if we have the ability to uh, potentially reduce the amount to get that to get that uh, in in the next to the seed where it needs to be, um, is 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 one huge advantage. And then secondly, is there may be times you're using a product that. Oh, cost-wise, whatever um, you reduce an amount, um, and that's not getting where it needs to be. And there's there's probably more value behind it, but that's what I just seen right off the bat, uh, um, looking at that, looking at that technology. Yeah, it was great to work with. It was great to see. I'm very excited to see Exact Shot uh, get out into customers' hands, into the wild. Um, I know coming here, 2024 crop season, 2024, we are going to see a couple of those products out there. So that is very exciting. Moving on to the next one, Joel, kind of unique to you and I uh, being here in Minnesota and the Dakotas. Uh, we don't necessarily get to see this product, but we got to show some love for our Washington, Oregon, the Pacific Northwest, our Southwest and California, Arizona. Uh, RDO Equipment Company has locations in all of those states out there. And, and we do from time to time, we try to get as much information in all the different ag avenues that we can. And so Smart Apply Joel, we got these sprayers. We've we've got sprayers in orchards and vineyards, and it's such a unique piece of the industry because it's not it's not your typical John Deere self propelled sprayer. It's not a a, a short line uh, type pull type sprayer or whatever it may be. These are unique. Well, I guess it is a short line pull type sprayer, but uh, they're unique. So Smart Apply being able to monitor the crop that it's going through, um, sensing that that biomass or, or crop density and applying where and when it needs to apply. Let me know. I, I want to hear your thoughts on this again, because it, it's kind of unique to the the region of the United States we're in and and where RDO has a geographical footprint. In my time working with the with the in the technology space here, I've spent extensive time in both our regions in the Southwest um, as well as the Northwest. And uh, one of the things uh, looking at the diversity of what we have in those areas, um, it's 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 complex for John Deere to bring technology to those areas um, that resonate with them. So when 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 this when Exact Apply. Um, first started being developed. Um, I believe John Deere partnered with that company, you know, and 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 they did this with a number of companies over or in the over the years with it around the technology where they see something um, that could potentially be integrated into into the John Deere ecosystem, and they work together with that company to a help develop and and a lot of times there's APIs uh, with bringing the data into our operations center um, that they help work towards too, um, and that one had a, a lot of unique things like with the API and also. Um, 
um, the technology around using lidar to sense the um, the, ma- the 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 amount of mass around the around the, the crop that it was spraying the either the orchard or the vineyard. Um, so it's just exciting to see uh, John Deere's uh, openness and also uh, see an opportunity um, um, for that. And uh, um, this spring, I was able to uh, see it firsthand, uh, traveled out to the Northwest. Um, we had a system straight set up and they were spraying hops. And hops, as they grow, you know, they're, they're low to the ground and, and, and they increase the size throughout the year. So um, it could sense and, and know exactly where those, where, the cro- where those hops were at, what stage they're at, and just apply the product right onto, the, onto where, they need it, where it needed to be. Um, so I know that the orchard vineyard growers that we work with um, are super excited to see some technology come into that space because they really haven't had a lot um, when, you, when we look at uh, what's, been, what's been going on in that space. There's opportunity in there, not only with Smart Apply, but also looking at some of the autonomous uh, type uh, uh, equipment uh, that we're working with as well in that space. Yeah, it that's really cool, and I I always forget about those hop yards. I I mean, who doesn't love a good uh, a good beverage, a good beer? Uh, we need those hops somehow. So to hear that you got to experience, you got to witness Smart Apply in a hop yard. Uh, as it was, as it was actually applying, is really cool. You know, we we think uh, vineyards and orchards and and uh, all that other stuff, but yeah, the the hops are another one yep. that we we got to remember. So, yep. really cool technology. And and to your point, Joel, John Deere's initiative to bring technology to some of the the some of the avenues of the ag industry that may not have that technology. Um, it just goes to show John Deere's commitment to growing the technology and, and bringing this to the producers in, in a large scale, large spectrum. Moving on to the next one, DataSync. So DataSync was something that was released uh, mid-2023 season. Um, very cool, very unique technology, being able to share essentially setup data or what we used to refer to as setup data, we would build a setup file in the operation center. We would get it out to the display. Today, we have the option, we can do setup files, we can do planned work files, or we can do, well, I shouldn't say or, I said or and and or uh, data sync. And that is taking all of that setup data, your machines, your implements, client farm field, all that type of stuff, and it shares it display to display, display to operation center, operation center to display. It shares it all seamlessly, real time, automatically. I want to hear your thoughts on how this is changing the the ag industry when it comes to clean or good data collection in terms of display setup. Yeah, this is one that uh, it's been it's been in the works for quite a while. Um, I kind of heard about uh, where they're going with it. Um, it also, it probably made me nervous uh, as well, Eric, because knowing that uh, that you're going to have to have things very cleanly set up. You know, a lot of operation centers where where it takes a lot of t- it takes time to keep things organized in there, and 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 if you aren't getting your field boundaries in and getting things in your client farm field set up properly and have things uh, the way that you need to be, um, it could be potentially, if you flip data sync on, it could be a disaster, really. I mean, yep. you could have stuff not right, you know, and, and uh, um, but on the flip side, the, the benefits of it and really making your lives easier, you know, of, of managing a large scale farm or even uh, any size, any size operation um, where everything is, everything is synced. So, uh, it's no longer a lot more easier for you may have operators that aren't as uh, that maybe it's a new operator coming in, uh, in, into that your that your uh, uh, higher man you brought on or higher person you brought on and uh, um, it just e- it just makes them th- makes things simpler simpler for them all the way around um, and we're we're continually. Uh, it, it's funny you brought up data sync because I actually just asked a question this morning if we know what customers are are using it today. That's the number one thing is just making sure we have good, good, clean setup of the of the entire organization um, prior to turning data sync on, and then just helping the customer understand um, uh, uh, what it does. You know, if somebody's gonna make one change in the display, and can they 
Could they do something wrong and delete everything across the organization? No, they can't. Uh, but again, it's those things that uh, um, we need to we need to uh, um, really help really help our uh, our customers understand and help them along. So. Yeah, you're absolutely right there. And I know uh, when I sat down with Jackson Lane and we talked about data sync, he stressed that, you know, you want to make sure things are clean. You want to make sure you understand data sync. And you're absolutely right that that there could be instances where if you have a bunch of let's say garbage guidance lines mm-hmm. that that maybe uh, uh, every time the tillage tractor goes out, they just make a new guidance line because it's easy. That's that's simple. Um, there are some some scenarios with data sync that you want to be aware of, that you want to be on top of having clean data, um, making sure you understand how the flow of that data works. But if you do understand that, if you do have good clean data, efficiency it not having to do, not having to take the time to do a setup file, um, whether you do or do not want to utilize work planner or planned work, um, there's just so much behind the the ease, the simplicity, the efficiency when it comes to data sync, sharing that data across your fleet and across the operation center. Yeah, and I don't know if I ever put a pencil to it, but you think about the the effort that it would take to on the front side to get everything all all correct what you want in there before in versus on the back side the amount of time you're spending if you don't have data sync turned on just knee jerk I know that I, it'd be a big number the amount of time the amount of time and effort uh, um, spent uh, if you don't have data sync turned on uh, versus when you do have it turned on. Absolutely. And we we up here in the uh, the Midwest or, or Minnesota and the Dakotas, uh, we get the opportunity. We have a downtime. We got a, a season called winter. We get some white stuff on the ground. Now, that being said, here we are uh, recording this actually December 18th uh, in Fargo, North Dakota, and there is no snow on the ground. It is well, I guess it's 12 degrees right now, but I think uh, North Dakota or, or the Fargo area Christmas is set to be like 35 degrees, 40 degrees, something like that. So regardless, where I was going with that is some areas of the United States or some areas of the world, I should say, have downtime. Um, they have an off season. And that's the great time to work with your operations center, get it clean, uh, get it uh, ready to go. Now, those of you in areas of the the world where you're farming year round, there really isn't much downtime. Um, collecting clean data, having clean setup data, uh, it all comes into efficiency and being able to continually move forward. So um, great technology, uh, awesome release of the product or, or the, uh, the digital product, I should say. Um, throughout the 2023 season. Now, another one, and and these last couple are going to kind of be bundled up a little bit, but another big release that came out 2023 was the G5 family of displays. And with that, uh, I was out in the field at our field technology days, got to sit down in the cab of a Gator with product specialist Jared Roloffs, and we talked about the G5 displays, but we also talked about boundaries and the importance of boundaries moving forward. So first, let's talk about the G5 displays and uh, how awesome those things are. Yeah, we're just, just started shipping here, what, in November, I believe. Maybe we got a couple at the end of October of, of displays. So we... I don't know that in the in the what do you call it the upper Midwest? That yeah, we're there we go, there we go. The <laughs> North Midwest, yeah, upper Midwest. There we go. Uh, to really uh, get them in the field uh, this spring, uh, we'll definitely see see the guys that are using them. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, the next evolution of the of the of a platform of displays uh, from John Deere and bringing the latest technology uh, advancement advancements in the G five. Um, so it's uh, exciting to see it continually develop and uh, technology that comes in there. And the, uh, the, the boundaries uh, is a big one um, when we look at, uh, at machine automation, um, where it's at today and where it's going into the future here. And, and historically also, uh, anybody, out there, anybody out there who's been uh, uh, working with these virtual boundaries uh, of their fields um, knows the complexity of it. And, and it's kind of a love-hate relationship as well. Uh, they can be, you can love them some days and other days when you got internal boundaries and they're shutting your planter off because of the low area they didn't see the year before and didn't get it, didn't get it updated and it's shutting your planter off. Uh, yeah, it can be your your uh, uh, your Achilles heel that day. So 
Um, and I, it, it, it's a, it's a complexity that, uh, that the industry is trying to, trying to figure out, try to, you know, and it's taken effort from at all levels, from the, from the, from the, from the, uh, from the equipment dealers and the support that we do, um, to our customers, to, um, their agronomists, their or their egg retailers that are working with their boundaries, um, and, and so on and so forth, and 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 trying to understand how do we how do we best manage them, how do you change them on the go, um, because they are going to be something to be very important um, when when autonomy when autonomous vehicles come out, they need to know where that where that boundary is at, and uh, and and knowing how to manage them year to year. And, and have something set up, you know, it's something you need to really think through. If you do it after the fact, um, it takes considerably more effort um, versus before it. Because um, we see a lot of times where um, uh, up here, sometimes the we don't always get the entire field planted, right? And uh, Or you may not know how much we can get planted of one crop you may have to do of of corn they may have to switch to soybeans and other areas um, but yet historically have always farmed as one field and just adds to the complexity of it and or we work with uh, with egg retailers that are trying to do variable rate uh, fertilizer and and the boundaries required in order to know hey how many acres do I have in that in that uh, in that field and uh, and to apply for the product to bring out of their of the unique blend of fertilizer you may be may, may be bringing out well if you don't really know how many you know the line changes a little bit because of a wet area um, uh, what is the actual what is the actual acres we have in here so so those are some of the complexities but on the flip side um, got to experience it firsthand uh, with uh, making a, a, a high quality boundary and using uh, uh, using headland create our headland right off of that boundary and as harvesting this uh, uh, harvesting this in our demo field here this uh, this fall, and the individual riding with me, I was trusting. I, I completely trusted. I think Jackson uh, drove that drove that drove the bo- exterior boundary um, uh, uh, with a Starfire Seven Thousand, and I trusted that that was spot on. And we're working. And as coming along the headland, what do we have? A forty-five foot head on that. Yeah, forty foot head on that. Forty one. foot 40 head foot on that head. one. Yep. Yeah, good. See, I didn't even know. So it, <laughs> I could have been hitting on or off, yeah. right? Yep. But anyway, um, we were probably it seemed we're like we're probably inches away from that REA pole. Um, but I know we planted that field with it, and I trusted it. And uh, the individual was riding with me. He's like, "Oh, you're gonna hit it. You're gonna hit it." It's like oh, you gotta trust the technology. And uh, and uh, yeah, we uh, went right by it. And uh, again. You need that high quality boundary, right? Uh, and be driven uh, during that year, you know, some things change. Maybe who know? Maybe the neighbor put something up that was closer that wasn't there before. They were able to plant next to, uh, but that just adds to the complexity, right? But using it, um, boy, it's a game changer to just uh, not have to steer that first pass. Um, and and what's coming in the future uh, uh, um, uh, when it comes to autopath and 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 uh, looking at a potential autopath off of our boundary line, you know, it's uh, we're going to need a good good quality boundary there. So. Yeah, you really hit it uh, when you made the comment about boundaries are something that you need to proactively think about. It's not just something that that we need to kind of leave in the background and be like, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll get a boundary or, oh, we have a boundary. It's the good quality boundaries and really thinking about them and, and making a plan. Like you said, the the boundary fill guidance line, utilizing that. I got the opportunity to um, do that exact same thing with the planter when we were out there planting our demo fields in South Dakota. And again, trusting when you got a 60 foot planter behind you, trusting that it's not going to catch that fence post trusting that it's not going to catch that tree. And it did. It worked great. There was nothing that I had to worry about as I was going through that boundary or or along that boundary. So it it's really cool to hear that you experienced similar in the combine when we were out there harvesting the soybeans. Um, it is a it is a wow factor when you have a good high quality boundary. Uh, like we said, Jackson was out there. He drove it with a a precision ag uh, integrated gator. So um, the new gators with the full cab, uh, everything is plug and play with the correct harnesses and brackets. He had a Starfire 7000 up top. He had the, uh, uh, I'm not sure if it was a G5 at that point. I think it was just a 4640. He drove that, got good high quality boundaries. So 
Yes, again, very important between the G5 displays, the importance of boundaries. It just, there's so much that goes into it. It's not just today, but it's also forward looking when you made the comment about autonomy and everything there. So, um, great information. Again, all of this information that Joel and I are talking about here, we had a podcast episode on it uh, throughout the 2023 calendar year. So, I invite you to go back, take a listen to these. Now, I want to wrap up here, Joel. There's two episodes left, but we're going to kind of bundle them together just because uh, they both live in in the same realm, the the hay and forage industry uh, or hay and forage corner of the ag industry. And I just want to touch on, you know, the technology that has been integrated over time. There's a lot of a lot of pieces of the ag industry that really took off fast with technology, be it planters, application equipment, combines, but there's certain pieces of the ag industry that it was still more just a manual process. There wasn't a lot of data being collected because maybe they didn't they didn't know what data needed to be out there. Maybe they didn't see the value in it. But moving forward, the the hay and forage. So we had the forage harvester episode um, with uh, Jason Arts, and then we had the Baylor Technology episode with uh, Jesse Centillion. So go back, listen to those episodes. But I want to hear your take, Joel, on the hay and forage industry and how the continued drive to integrate technology is going to help those types of farmers, whether they're a dairy or they're a a custom baler, custom forage harvester, things like that. Uh, How can this data, how can these sensors and and, uh, data collection help them grow their business? When we look at the livestock production, um, whether it's dairy or beef, you know, one of the things I, I recognize talking to some of the herd managers or the manager of one of the ranches, you know, their their mindset um, is unique when compared to a grain farmer. Their passion and and their knowing and understanding is around is around that herd, around that animal, and and it's not necessarily as intimate with the equipment. You know, uh, so compared to a grain farmer who's out there running the equipment, um, the 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 dairyman or in don't get me wrong, they do run the equipment, but it's they they their their connection is to the livestock. Yep. Um, so what we've been seeing is is and it maybe the technology has entered that space a little later than it has on the large grain area, um, but the opportunity is there. And you see a lot of the you see a lot of technology coming into look at our dairies, um, um, what's going on to in the in the milk production um, or in the even in the and in the and in the uh, beef production. When we look at what's coming into the with the baler technology and the forage harvester and be able to understand uh, starting to understand. Um, the the nutrient value of the corn silage you're putting up, and or the uh, when you look at the bales, the potential there. Um, you know, with, with uh, bale documentation just coming out for round balers, you know, we've been have been exposed to some of it, some of it with our large square, square balers. Um, there's a lot of potential there. Um, first starts off with just documenting uh, what we're doing. You know, um, is interesting because I I was just driving home this uh, weekend from uh, uh, hunting out in Montana, and uh, my friend, my partner that I hunt with, um, uh, he's got a he's got a beef herd, and he was just talking about he was bailing, and uh, he mentioned about the different types of net wrap they have, like and and different colors, and he goes, It'd "Be really nice if I could pick out. I know this is maybe that maybe the bail. I'm maybe I'm bailing some um, some CRP or 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 prairie hay, and I get an area." that maybe has some cattails or some lower production type stuff. And I really like to mark that bale. So he had a unique way. He was using bale wrap and he'd, he'd throw twine on that one. So he knows it's lower quality. And thinking in my head is like, boy, we're like that close and to be able to just document, uh, um, uh, that, that bale virtually, you know, and, uh, uh, to know their, their higher quality, lower quality, or maybe it's a a moisture thing. And as we're documenting this moisture. So, um, I think I just really feel we're just, we're just at the cusp of that, you know, um, as, as we see this technology integrated in our, into our, or into our round balers that John Deere is doing. Um, but I look at some of the stuff technologies that's been, uh, implemented some of the, in the, in our, in our car, cotton business, you know, so, uh, uh, there's a lot of opportunity there, but when you can make that tie to, 
for that for that herd manager or that uh, 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 ranch manager to to tie the the quality of the feed um, that their animals are receiving and they know what that is. Um, that's where you make that tie. That I feel that tie is made and and the emphasis of hey, we need this technology on it to help improve our herd. You know, and uh, um, so yeah, I I really see I feel that what we're putting in the equipment right now um, is we're just at the cusp of it. Yeah, it everything from the constituent sensing on the forage harvesters and knowing the nutrients that are that's in that silage to the baler technology, like you said. Uh, uh, I almost uh, the the story you told about being able to monitor your bales based on quality or something. I mean, I look at that and the the first thing that popped in my mind was like a variety locator for bales and being able to go back and be like, well, no, okay, that part of the field we changed the quote unquote variety because we just know that it's a lower quality than the other area of the field or whatever you may be doing. So really cool to hear that that the cattlemen out there are even thinking about that, that they they want ways to better document. They want ways to learn and grow similar to a, a grain farmer, similar to your corn and soy, your small grains, whatever it may be. The ag industry is continuing to grow and giving the hay and forage more technology to work with, more information to learn from, to be able to make educated decisions off of what they're doing. So to wrap this up, Joel, uh, before we go, I want to hear one last thing from you. I always enjoy, uh, like you said at the the beginning of this show, um, you and I, we we sit down almost on a daily basis just chatting about some of this stuff. So to get our, our thoughts on the podcast and everything, I want you to answer one last question. What are you most excited about with with your whole career throughout agriculture, like you said? And that, that was one of the reasons why I wanted to bring you on is because of your experiences, your knowledge, all the different things you've done in the ag industry, and your love and passion for the technology. Going forward, what are you most excited about when it comes to some of these new technologies? Um, maybe it's something old that's getting revamped or or uh, more heavily adopted. What excites Joel Kaczynski about technology in the ag industry? Boy, to put it on, to put one thing, Tony, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to name a couple. That's uh, fine. But, that but, is uh, fine. First off, pro- I'll, I'll first stay with autonomy. Right. Number one, continually hear about the labor shortages that uh, trying to find a good operator for your for your farm to run your equipment, and uh, and it's getting harder and harder to find to find that. And and uh, secondly, just look at how that technology could potentially impact the farm. Um, and, and, and John Deere, uh, released their autonomous tillage. They, they showed it off at CES and, and that's getting closer to production, right? It has potentially a huge game changer, but also it's going to change the way that our customers, uh, they need to look at how it's going to impact their operation as well. Um, to continue to do things, you know, how you traditionally did them with uh, having a human being run on the tractor versus nobody in there. Um, but I think about how, um, uh, uh, it, it it's a technology that can help both large farms, medium-sized farms, small farms. Um, when I think of uh, uh, somebody with a with a with a medium to small, where maybe they want to catch that their kids' uh, um, basketball game or football game that evening, and and can get their tractor running, going in the field to get that field worked and prepped for the next day, um, while they're enjoying their kids' game, and and. Uh, secondly, I look at, especially in our area here, our window, our window of opportunity to get the get things done in in the, in the op in the in the in the right timing. You know, it has a huge economic impact if you don't. And knowing that uh, we can utilize more hours of the day <laughs> uh, to get things done potentially um, is a game could be uh, is has a potential to be a huge game changer. Um, the uh, other one is just looking at the the technology coming out that's reducing our inputs, right? When we look at the where we look at the sea and spray sprayer of uh, applying spray just where this where, where the weed is at, uh, or the or whatever you want to tar- whatever you're targeting, um, and also we we already talked about the exact shot and and looking that where we're putting less product down um, on our field, which basically which gives 
uh, for, to, uh, uh, from a consumer perspective, um, a very positive, uh, positive thing where you're reducing the amount of, of, uh, of, of what's going on. And also from our customers, reduce the amount of inputs that they're putting, putting on, uh, on their field to get the, the, the same production and or more production, um, of it. So, um, just super exciting to see those technologies come to fruition and what, uh, the challenge that will bring both us as a dealer um, and to our customers, and and overcoming those hurdles as those as those technologies are are developed. So it's a uh, just exciting time to be to be part of it. A lot of it again thrown at us, um, but it does excite me because that that those challenges are what what make us what makes us better right and uh, and there's going to be some days where things aren't working <laughs> working well with integrating those technologies in it um, but I've seen uh, from from looking in the past looking at auto track coming on and the difference that made um, uh, to our customers and not just from a from uh, being more efficient but just less stress and 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 we all know we have enough of that today, especially what the what our customers are being burdened with. But uh, um, uh, I just look at that, and then looking forward how this it just continues to, to continues to develop. And those are probably two of my two top hitters I'll put out there right now. Yeah, like you said, very exciting times to be in the ag industry. The technologies that are out there, um, some of them yet to come, but a lot of good things, a lot of good information. Joel, I want to thank you for taking the time to sit down with me. Every topic that we discussed uh, was an episode in the 2023 uh, podcast season, so I invite you to go back, have a listen if you haven't already, or or listen again if you'd like to. But again. Thank each and every one of you for listening to the show, sharing us with your friends, um, the subscribers, the people that comment, the people that reach out to us and say, hey, you know, we really enjoy the show or whatever it may be. Big, big thank you to each and every one of you. So uh, thanks again for doing this, Joel. I couldn't have thought of a better person to, to sit and chat through this here at the end of the 2023 season. Yeah, thanks, Tony. I just want to give kudos to you as well and the positive impact that you're making on the egg industry with doing this podcast. And also, again, to all the listeners out there um, and engaging with it because um, uh, it is very much a community when it comes to comes to this uh, to the egg space. And it's just great to be engaging with it and continue improving everybody's lives with it and being engaged with uh, conversations like this. So thank you, Tony. And thank you to our listeners. All right, that wraps up this show. Uh, as I ended last year, I will end again. There we have it. The 2023 RDO Agriculture Technology Podcast has come to a close. Please make sure to subscribe to this podcast if you haven't already. You can subscribe to the show on the many different podcasting apps that we're streaming this out to. We've got it on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, as well as many others. While you're out there, drop us a review. We'd love to hear what you think about the show. And finally, make sure to follow RDO Equipment Company on Facebook, Instagram, and X, and catch all of our latest videos on YouTube. You can fo also follow me on Twitter at RDO Tony K.